Hi, I'm Lisa. This is Martina. And I want to thank Andy Budd straight up as well. He's going to be helping us a little bit later on today. I don't want to do too much talking because I want this to be quite a practical exercise. Um, when we got the call on Sunday, I think it was, that, that we, we needed to do kind of an emergency UX workshop, uh, I was thinking about wh what, was the best, what was the best thing that we could do with you guys? What was going to give you the most... The, the best kind of way forward, the most useful thing that you can take back and use on a day-to-day -day basis. The first thing that popped into my head was actually something that um, that I do fairly regularly with clients, and and I but I thought, oh, these guys won't need this because it's all about value proposition honing. And I know if anyone knows how to do a pitch, it should be you guys. Um, but I, I heard a couple of the mentors saying that maybe there was a tiny bit more work that you could do on just getting it a little bit more snappy. The thing that, that um, the workshop that we almost did is one that I called Design the Box. And if you Google it, it's a fairly well-known one. Has anyone done it before? Yeah? So it's, 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 it's good fun, um, but not only is it good fun, but it really does help you have the right kind of conversations and make the right kinds of decisions that's going to help you in terms of talking to investors, but also communicating with clients. And this is an example that the guys at Airbnb did. Obviously, not Airbnb, but for the, um, the presidential campaign previously um, and this was the thing that they did actually that got them a bit of attention and ultimately got them funding when everyone thought their idea was kind of nuts. Um, so a as you can see what they've done here is taken something that actually doesn't exist in a box at all like for example the Obama campaign um, and said if it was in a box what would be on the box and so that's just something that you could think about doing as an as a exercise for yourself for your own organizations is think about if you put your product into a box what would be on the box? What would the brand look like? What kind of pictures would go in there? What would the strap lines be? You know, what what if it was a box of cereal? Then you know, what what would go into the nutritional information? It's a little bit kind of uh, metaphoric, but it's it's definitely a great exercise. Um, yeah, so that's that. So the one that we are going to do today, though, is is customer experience mapping. This isn't kind of straight out of the box um, user experience. It's actually a technique that I've kind of borrowed stolen, used in collaboration with uh, some other disciplines, um, service design and straight up customer experience who are kind of more marketing than, than we are, where user experience people are typically more focused on digital interfaces. Customer experience people are focused on the, the whole breadth of where customers are and what they're doing and all of that kind of thing. And they do customer experience mapping a fair bit in large organizations. I've started doing it with my smaller clients over the past kind of 12, 18 months, and it's been probably one of the most useful things, I think, in terms of really helping to keep an organization focused on what it means to have a good customer experience, good user experience. Because unfortunately, it's not the kind of thing that you can just get a contractor in for two weeks and do your user experience, it's not that simple. All the decisions that you guys are making every day um, m m have a dramatic effect on what somebody like Martina or myself or Andy can actually do for you when it, when it comes time to come in and help you look at what it's like to, to interact with you on the web or apps or mobile or wherever we are. So, ooh, <laughs> that sounds dramatic. Um, so yeah, so, so what we're looking at today is trying to, trying to find a way of putting all of this knowledge together into one place so that you can keep a focus on what's important, what you need to do, and you can sort of transmit that knowledge to people within your team and make decisions that are good both for your business but also for your overall user experience as well. So whenever I go and do work with an with organization, I'm kind of, this is what I kind of call the, the strategic stack that, that I like to have, and ideally, Companies will have already done the stuff at the beginning. Value proposition, experience, strategy, target audience, business model. A lot of that stuff hopefully is already in place. A lot of the time it's not and I kind of have to help out a little bit, but that's fine. I enjoy that. The bit that we're looking at is this bit in here, the customer journey or value map. So I'm going to work on the assumption that you guys have done a lot of this top stuff. You know what your value proposition is. You've got a sense of what kind of experience it is that you're trying to create for your customers, for your users. You've got a sense of who your target audience are and you know your business model. If you know anything, I'm sure you know your business model. Um, so we're going to look at customer value map. The reason that we do this is because it's one thing to kind of talk about how well we know our product and how well we know what it's like to interact with us as an organization, as a product, but actually, actually really properly knowing that in practice, the details of it, what it's like to sign up, for example. You know, you, I, do, I do work with the guys at Drupal. 
I don't know if you know Drupal. Um, and I went through and did a sign up for Drupal.org the other day, and you've got no idea how horrendous that experience is. Or maybe you do. But the reason for that is that when they did the redesign, the guys who did the redesign, they already had an account. And it's nobody's job to go back and check that. You know? So it's really easy to let stuff like that fall through the gaps. And when I went through and kind of screen grabbed every step, step of the process, there were just absurd errors and horrible messages, awful, awful stuff sending all the wrong messages. It's really important that we don't let stuff like that fall through the gaps. And it means that we're actually being kind of properly user-centered, rather than kind of user-centered, which is a term that uh, Kenneth Bowles and James Box, was it Andy? Bowles and Box? The um, undercover UX? Was it? Oh, there you go. Anyway, I, so I, I stole it from the guys who wrote the um, undercover UX book, which is definitely worth grabbing hold of if you don't have it already. They talk about b being user-centered rather than user-centered. Unfortunately, because I know that we like templates and we know, you know, t explicit instructions, A, B, C is really good. With most things design and UX, there's no one perfect way to do it. It always depends on context. And that's exactly the same with today's exercise. So I'm going to show you some different examples. This is a Starbucks experience map of what it's like to go from anticipating your coffee through the process of entering a store, engaging with the different customer service people, walking out the door and then reflecting on your coffee, as you do, perhaps. Um, this is another different example. And this is starting to bring in the different touch points. So you're looking at um, what you can do online, what's happening mobile, what's happening when you're actually dealing with their people and what's happening in the back office as well. Um, here's one that's definitely kind of a work in progress. Having something like this is better than having nothing at all. This one's kind of a lot prettier. So it's got a lot of kind of annotations around the side. You can tell this has been done by a consultant. Um, it's got lots of annotations around the side. It's got a map of the, um, the different stages that people go through, so discovering, investigating, preparing, applying, receiving. I think this is a, a, a mortgage application or something like that. And then it's got a little map down here of the highs and lows of the service. So it starts really good, then it gets really crap, a little bit better, fantastic, a bit crapper again, unfortunately ends kind of relatively high, which is what you're aiming for. Um, and, uh, and looking again down here at all of the different um, channels that, the, that people are communicating with. So one of the great things about this process, you guys hopefully don't have this problem so much now because you're probably relatively small. As you get bigger and you start getting departments, maintaining a coherent customer experience becomes increasingly difficult. Even when you start using different bits of software for different things, it, became, it be can become really difficult to keep a picture of what it's like to be on the receiving end of all of the stuff that you're doing at customers. So this is a, this you need a way, you need some kind of a, of a dashboard or a way of doing this, and this is a very analog kind of dashboard. Lego, I've got their own, of course, as you can tell, it's kind of cute. Um, you can use cartoons, if you like, and flowcharts. This is a, a lean version, because I know lean's very of the moment at the moment. Um, and this is the one that, uh, this is a, probably the most complicated one of all, which is, of course, come up with by a user experience person. Um, Indy Young wrote a book called Mental Models. This is a fabulous way of, of thinking about things, going out and doing research. And here you've got all of the different things that people are thinking about when they're thinking about going to the movie. So they're choosing a theatre, they're choosing a time, they're going to the movie. And then down here at the bottom, there's all of the different things that the website has got in place to support each of the different activities that people are doing. So you can kind of see where there are big gaps and where, where things are being supported really well. But basically, it all kind of starts like this, standing in front of the wall, drawing in some kind of a structure, using post-it notes, of course, um, and start starting to try to work out how you can create a, um, a way of showing what it's like to be your customer, how you're communicating with your customer, and how that experience is kind of tracking at the moment. Because the different thing that I want to do that the service designers um, and a lot of the customer experience people aren't doing is they're not actually using this as a live living thing that they're putting data on and they're measuring and they're using it to help guide their decisions on a day-to-day -day basis. So this is, a, this is actually a big design exercise. There's no way that we going to get to the absolute final correct answer in 45 minutes or less. So I want to give you a little bit of a head start. This is a really kind of rough template. Um, it's it's a, as generic as it gets. So you're going to want to shape this to fit your customer journey and, and your product. But as a starting point, this is a good place to start. And 
what we've got here is columns that represent uh, the, the sort of the pathway, the, the life cycle of the customer experience. So the first part is what are you doing to actually attract people to think about engaging with your product to begin with. Then you've got a, a phase around evaluation. So here, they're, they're looking at your homepage or whichever page they land on or whatever sort of communication they get, and they're thinking, is this for me or is this not for me? Has this got something that offers value to me? Is this cool? Is this where my friends are? All of those kind of questions. And then they go through a sign-up process, uh, and then they start getting into that onboarding, that engagement, where they're, they're sort of testing it out and, and seeing whether or not the product's going to deliver the value that they hoped that it might to begin with. And then hopefully, they all end up at this end, where they're properly engaged and they're actually acting as evangelists for you back out into the community again. And what you want to do is try to map as much onto this as you can in terms of what your organization's doing and what's happening to customers as they move through. So we've divided this up here into different channels. So this one's got web, mobile, email, and a bit of social on the bottom there as well. Um, and up in web here, we might have things like example campaigns that are going out. So if you've got SEO campaigns or banner ads or I any of that kind of thing, then you can put in here some examples of the campaigns that are going out. Might not be so relevant to you right now, but once you start kind of getting out and, and promoting across having different people in charge of promoting your organization in different ways. It, it's a really, it's nice to know that everyone's kind of saying roughly the same thing and it makes sense, it's coherent with each other. Um, here, we're kind of mostly looking at funnel analysis. So are we actually converting people from when they land on whichever page and they hit join or sign up uh, through to the other end? You know, how's it going? So looking at how many steps are involved with that. And then here we want to look at what does it actually mean to become an engaged customer, an, en an engaged user. So for example here, you know, if, you, if it's something where you're posting something up, you might say that it's not really until they get to like five or more posts that we think that they're actually properly engaging, posts or whatever. Um, and here, these, these, these little um, boxes with Xs represent examples of what the interface is like. So you can actually pop that up and it's there as a ready reference all the time. So you've, you can always have a look and see what does our sign up path look like and people can scribble ideas on it and changes on it. And if you're A-B testing, you could be putting the two up or however many up that you're, that you're testing at a time. Basically trying to get as much as we can out of individual people's heads um, and into an environment where however many of you can stand around in front of it and go, okay, what's important? And the way that we know what's important is that we actually start to put some, some data into it. So you do things like look at your funnel analysis and say, okay, 60% of people are getting through step one, but by the time we get to step two, we're losing all, all but 8%. That's, that's obviously a big issue. Um, here we've got people, you know, lots of people are, are getting one post in, but then there's a massive drop off between, you know, the second and the third post. So we're, we're not managing to get that onboarding experience. We're not getting people back and regularly engaging. So that's obviously a big problem. Um, down here, I don't know how readable that is. It's like if you, if you got an email from somebody who's already a member kind of inviting you or telling you what's going on, you know, we've got a really high open rate, but a really low conversion rate. So maybe that's a big challenge for us as well. So by mapping this all out, it, it kind of, and putting numbers on it, it helps us really stay focused on where are the big issues, wh what's really important. So when we've got different pieces of work that we want to do, like um, somebody desperately wants to have paging on the comments pages, for example, and somebody thinks that, well, th you've done some user research and you found that people absolutely hate capture, absolutely hate it. You know, on the surface, I mean, they're two pretty obvious examples, but when you're staring at pages after pages of things that you could be doing, backlogs are really hard to work through. They're really hard to prioritize, and that's one of the biggest challenges that I have with clients is like, we've got like, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of things in our backlog. What's important? Well, how, do, how do we, what do we do when we get all of this feedback from customers? Which ones do we act on? Which ones don't we? This helps to kind of put a framework together that you can actually take a little idea and put it on here and say, so this is where money's made, and, and you know, if, if the value of a customer here is even more important, that's where more money's made. So the closer it is to that, the more we want to be unblocking what the customer experience problems are. 
If you've got two or more sets of incredibly different customers, so you might have consumer customers and you might have business to business who have kind of effectively got a different product, you want to do different ones of these for different customers, but you don't want to do a different one for every kind of vague variant of a customer. The fewer you have of these, the better. Ideally, you only have one. And what you're trying to do is really maintain an alignment between what customers value and what you as a business value. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, they, they should be the same thing. What your customer really values should tie into what your business really values because a customer who values you is a customer who will pay you and pay you more. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to make one of these for your business, Real, at least the beginning sketch of it. And what you want to do is start by creating the picture. So think about what's, what does a life cycle look like for your customer from when people may first hear of you through the sign up and the onboarding experience to the point where they, they, you know, they're the ones who are out there telling people about how fantastic you are and recruiting new people for you. What does that journey look like for them? What are the, what are the key um, pathways that they go through? What are the key interfaces that they're coming up against? What are the key user flows for them? Um, what channels is this happening on? Is it mostly on web? Is there really some really important stuff? Is all of the engagement stuff happening on a mobile? Make sure that you've got that mapped out. Um, make sure that you're putting in there somehow, making it really visible where the money is made and where money is either lost or, or more is not being made, where there's potential for making more that you're maybe not capitalizing on. Um, and, and try to look at the, the different places that you're, that, you're, that you're messaging customers. So I didn't mention email. Email's a, a really tricky thing to keep, to keep a track of uh, in terms of what it's like to receive your emails all the time. It's a really good way just to sort of map out along the sort of pathway here. What emails are you sending out at different points? Are you sending too many in one place and not enough somewhere else? Um, and also another thing that you can pop on there is some social media stuff. So by tracking sentiment, you know, what are people saying when they're going through that evaluation phase? What are the kind of key comments that are coming out there? Pop that in there. Any, any data that you can find about your customers and what they're doing, find a way to kind of pop that on there so that everyone knows about it. Because this is a place where you can get tacit knowledge out of people's heads, people who do actually look at the analytics reports and, and know stuff, but, but other people don't know it. You know, this is, a, this is the way you can kind of get out and share it. And this is going to become more and more valuable to you as your company gets larger and more people come on board. So that's adding in the data and measurements, which is pretty much what we talked about. So really interesting stuff to know is what, what it costs you to get a customer and what they're worth to you once you've got them. And sometimes that means some segmenting because some customers are worth more than others. So thinking about that segmentation is really important. And keeping track of growth. So how many do you have now and how many more did you get this week or this month um, in each of the different segments? Uh, again, you know, as Mike was saying earlier, you know, what, what you're measuring, you don't have to think about anymore. Just having it there all the time is a really valuable thing. Email open rates, again, are really, this is the sort of thing that, that we're usually one person in the team really knows really well and nobody else does. Um, funnel analysis is really, really useful. You can use Google Analytics for that. Um, so there's all sorts of things. Just think about all of the different ways that, that you get insight from what your customers are doing and thinking and saying about you and how can you map that on here to help you make better decisions. So make it big, put it on a wall. The customers that I've worked with, clients that I've worked with on this have actually kind of taken over wall, huge amounts of wall space. And they've usually got their kind of scrum board there and then this one next to it. And, and this, this one is kind of like the longer term planning um, environment and then you, you take stuff over and put it onto the scrum board based on what's important. And it's a design challenge. So it's, we're not gonna crack it in an hour, but we can make a good start. And they will all be different ultimately. So I think, I think I managed to get that posted up um, with just some of the notes of what things need to go on there. But Martina and Andy and I are here. We'll wander around and help you. We have stationery. So we've got um, some A4 paper that might be good to sort of put together into a larger, a larger piece like this. We have sticky tape that will help you do that. I'd recommend grabbing some wall space. These things are much easily, much more easily made on walls and then kind of kept on walls than they are on these tiny little desks at least. We've got some Sharpies, different colors for color coding and highlighting important things. Um, some blue tack for sticking, some post-it notes. Post-it notes are really good for kind of initial planning. So I think this might go there. I think that might go there. Um, so I would recommend getting a, a nice chunk of eight pieces of A4, 
spending the first kind of 10 minutes or so just kind of sketching out a bit of a plan before you make it big. Once you've got something that you're reasonably happy with, it'll probably take about three or four quick goes, then make it big and start kind of actually plotting stuff in. It, you probably don't have all of the data on hand that you need to do it, but you can make a good start in terms of an outline uh, and then you can go home and fill in the rest. Thank you.